You're listening to the Decidedly Podcast with Sanger Smith and Sean Smith. Our mission is to help business owners like you defeat bad decision making so you can improve your health, wealth, and relationships. We do this by digging deep into the stories and expertise of our guests and distilling their knowledge into actionable wisdom for you to carry into your life and business. If you're new to the show, welcome. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our weekly episodes. If you prefer to watch this week's episode, head on over to YouTube for the full video. Now, let's get into this week's episode and defeat bad decision making in your life and business. I was, uh, I, I get on these rabbit trails sometimes and, and then just waste time researching stupid ass things. Okay. I think I, can you relate? I do that a lot. Yeah. And, but, but I feel bad. I feel better about it after what was the episode we were talking about, about a joyous exploration or okay. looking at that. That's how I justify it. So the, the issue was I saw this image as an aerial image of a baseball field in this town. Right. And in the town, there was this building that intruded into the outfield okay. of the baseball field. And I was like, huh, that, that seems weird because it was like 400 feet on one side and then like 200 feet on the other. I said, that's really odd. Mm-hmm. How, how should baseball fields be sized? You, you know what the answer is? However they feel like. However the yeah. hell they want. Yeah, they're there's, all over the place. There's no standard to it. I'm like, well, that's it. Who designed this game where you can just like, what's the field look like? Uh, it's, it's whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Well, how, just, how far uh, should it go out? That doesn't matter. Far enough. Yeah, far enough. But not too far. But not too close either. That's and the a, walls can be however height they want to be. Too. Yes. You yeah. Got little short walls in Yankee Stadium and, and massive walls. Like Boston. in Boston, there's this big green monster that's super tall. Yeah. And, it's just yeah, it's interesting and i think it, it goes to you know there's some standards because the plate distances the, are all the same the, the plate distance the mound the distance same. is the same the mound height is the same mm-hmm. the plates the size of the plate is the same but the all the most all important crazy. stuff out where all the home runs happen i, well, I don't know that. if that's the most important i think the it's plates the most are the most plates are the most important okay all the right. structure of the game is the same every time and then the the distances and they, you know it's kind of like analogous to life you know, you got to have the, there's the basics that you got to follow. Okay. You got to have the plates. Sure. You got to have four of them and have three of them. Okay. Uh, the, sure. Right? Right. You got to have the, there's some rules you got to follow. And then there's some areas where you can have freedom, but if you don't follow the rules, you can't have any freedom for it long. It turns into cricket and nobody wants to watch that. Nobody understands the rules to that game. Yeah. So in business, there's some rules. Have a standard. Have some standards. You got to fault. You got to do the tried and true. You got to do the, the simple stuff. But give people the flexibility to be creative. There you go. Look at that insight. Yeah, look at that out of, out of a stupid rabbit trail. I've yeah. Heard. Speaking of someone who um, is willing to experiment uh-huh. with, with the, have the freedom to make the outfields different sizes, so to speak, in other areas of life, Matt Boudreaux is transforming the landscape of leadership development for young men, turning them into leaders. He's the founder of Acton Academy. Placer schools. They were schools with development on emphasis and cultivating confident, independent young people. Since then, he's moved away from Acton and to Apogee Strong. He's a co-founder of Apogee Strong, a mentorship program designed for 12 to 22-year-old young men uh, to take on the challenges presented by men who have come before them. So it's a wonderful program he founded with Tim Kennedy. We got to talk with Matt about his wisdom and going through the public school system as a student and a teacher and applying the 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 good things and the 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 things that the public school system gets wrong into a new system of schooling for the next generation of young men in America and we took some of these learnings and applied them to business so whether you're a parent of 12 to 20 year old sons, uh, you're 12 to 22 years old yourself, or you're a business owner with no kids and kind of looking at how do I relearn and unlearn and how do I do that for my employees too? This podcast will give you some great insight from Matt. Stick around, laugh a little bit, learn a lot. I'm Sanger Smith with my dad, Sean Smith, and this is Decidedly. Matt, I was thinking about you on my honeymoon. 
I mean, that's about the best way to start a podcast ever. What, right that's there. what I was thinking. That's the, either the best compliment or the creepiest statement you could ever say. Yeah. No, so both, and that, both, but that's what makes, <laughs> what makes it so awesome. Cause that's the first thing we've ever actually said to each other in person. Exactly. That makes you it even better. I like that. Tell me about this. Well, let me tell you why. So I went to Barcelona and we went to the, this was last week, we were in the Picasso museum and there were all the typical like Cuba's paintings that you expect to see from Picasso in the blue period. And before that, there were his early th art. And it's nothing like all of the famous Picassos that you recognize. There was one in particular that was, uh, he painted when he was 15. It was a first communion painting. It was this young girl flowing dress and it just signified so clearly this life transition. It's like becoming of something. And so it made me think of the work that you do and it challenging young boys to and grow into men. And I was like, man, when did I, when did I become a man? And I think we still waiting. <laughs> it's a challenge because <laughs> there's not that cultural, you know, it, demarcation. Yeah. There's uh, not, not a bar mitzvah that, that you have as a, yeah. So what do you think it was for you? Can you identify a moment? Yeah, I wish I could. That's part of the problem, right? Is I wish I could give a, a certain moment where it's like, okay, now, now I am a man. It's, it was a series of events and ultimately a series of decisions. And that's fine. We can reach that. You know, we can reach that stage on our own. Potentially, we start taking on more responsibility. And we start pouring into others and we start defining our purpose and we start, you know, doing all the things that we would define as quote unquote maturity. And that's great. But what about having somebody that ushers you into that? What about somebody that sets the foundation for that early on? You know, we've lost that in in culture in a, in a number of ways. The the rites of passage for for me, it had to be a series of decisions to take on more responsibility. It had to be a series of decisions to put away, you know, the childish pursuits. And to so it was a series. Of, there was no one thing where it's like, oh, now I'm a man. And again, it, it's um, not that a rite of passage when brought through, you know, from other men automatically makes you a man, but that is, there's such an important symbolism there that we've absolutely lost. You know, I always tell people 1944, man, 1944 was when we started using the word teenager. We didn't use wow. that. Wow. People don't know that, that we didn't use that prior to, it wasn't even a term prior to, and we've essentially made it this thing where it's like, okay, well, since your brain's not quote unquote fully developed, well, then you're going to, we're going to give you this free license to act like a monkey for the next 10 years. And that's a disservice to our young people. When we have those rites of passage, when we hold that bar up, they'll meet it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something that's certainly absent from our culture. You see it in other cultures where there is that rite of passage into adulthood with quinceanera or bar mitzvah or lots of cultures have that. And we just, we just don't, and you know, I've I've heard people say that parents really never view their their offspring as adults until they have their own kids. So that's probably too late. <laughs> but, but, but you know, mentally, that's that's where where you get. Let me. This is great. But let me back up and just kind of give us a a little bit of background, Matt, on how you got interested in uh, developing men and, and education and and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, the I tell people my story in education started when I was four. I promise I'm not going to take you all the way back 40 years and and bring you through this long long diatribe. But uh, I've never been anything that I'd say. You know, I'm not overly intelligent, but I'm really good at seeing patterns. And I remember sitting in a classroom at four years old, realizing there was a game going on. Realizing I was, I remember very clearly being put in the red group, looking around, going, "Okay, those kids can't read. They can read a little better than they can. They're a little better, and these are the best readers. That's interesting." They're grouping us together by this. By eight years old, I remember thinking, I'll never get anything less than A's. I just, I get how this game works. I'll win the game. Piece of cake. And I did. I got my straight A's because I understood the pattern, not because I was that smart. So I started looking at patterns uh, very, very early on. And so in, in my 20s, I come out of you know college with my straight A's doing all the right things, but I had no idea who I was. I turned on a job at the White House and now I'm like, all right, cool. Who am I? What do I do? I have no idea how to do anything but play school. 
that's the only pattern I've ever figured out because that's what I was told is going to have everybody throwing these jobs at me, right? And so I end up at Stanford University and I'm seeing these patterns play out over and over and over. The young people are way smarter than me, but they're they're failing a life. They're miserable. Uh, the maturity level is not there. The responsibility is not there. The efficacy is just not there. And so naively I went, okay, well, I'll go help by being a public school teacher. I'll start talking to these young men when they're when they're younger. And so that that really is what began the progression. And um, as I started moving through public school teaching, you know, and, and administration, private school, I started realizing that uh, school was a game that's not meant to develop people in general, and it's surely not meant to develop young men. So um, I was forced with a couple of decisions. One was launch my own campuses to send my own children. Um, but two, I wanted to do something specific for the young men, even, even in the campuses that I had that were built, there were more uh, akin to having a young person develop the right way, I still wanted to make sure we had good men pouring into young men. So that was kind of the th probably 30 years of trajectory right there in 60 seconds or less. I'm old enough to remember when Carter put the Department of Education in place in 79. Uh, I haven't checked back on how we're doing educationally as a nation, but I'm sure it's awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, we have that whole department. So well, listen, 92% of our population over 18 has a government diploma. And I would say 92% of our population wildly educated. Wouldn't you? Yeah. They're, they're probably doing, probably killing it. Yeah. We're doing I real saw well. some statistic. Don't hold me to the number, but it was maybe the Detroit public school system. This. We're only 5% of the kids were reading at grade level. Yeah. You know, across the system. There's a million different issues with with all that. One that we've decided that grade level is a thing. That's not a thing. I don't know how old you guys are, but I don't know if I read at a 44 year old grade level. What grade is that? I don't. So like that in and of itself is a weird concept. The point is we should be able to read, read well, and not read just to regurgitate, you know, some sort of answer. We should be able to allow books to do what they're supposed to do, which is change our lives. But we kill. The love of reading early and it's not just a school issue there's a multifaceted. we have fatherless homes we have i mean there's a million things but you're absolutely right that these trends uh, in education are across the board other than the education uh failures like not meeting the mark what was it that you observed in students as a public school teacher that you thought whoa i it, like this needs to be solved yeah it's the so it's what i call i appreciate that question it's what i call the meta skills so we have a um, a religious belief because we've all grown up in this that, that academia is what should be put on the pedestal, uh, and that that is even though we all logically understand this isn't real, put academia on a pedestal as long as we do well from an academic standpoint. Well, gosh, then life's going to turn out really, really well. The problem is we all know people who academically did really well and their life has sucked. We also know people who academically were garbage, but they're amazing humans with an amazing life. So that's not the, you know, the game of school does not match the game of life. Yeah. And so the game of life, these meta skills, that's what I observed the most. So I've got all of these, again, young people at Stanford. I'm going, oh my God, you're so much smarter than I am but they don't understand how to write the check for their tuition. They're coming in and they're crying about the amount of homework. Uh, they're transferring to into the workplace and I'm working with these organizations that are like, we want to fire all of them. They don't show up. The work ethic isn't there. When they're there, they're stressed. They're highly anxious. Um, you know, Physically, they're breaking down emotionally, relationally. The things that actually matter we're not doing really a, a good job at, well, shouldn't education uh, partially help you towards those goals? Yeah, you know, and when I look at it, some of the history of education, how it started, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because this is your area, but wasn't it started in this country as a way to- Like a warehouse worker yeah, training for- Yeah, feed in, in an industrial- Factory work. Revelation, yeah. To, to, so you yeah. want- you don't want people who think for themselves. You want compliant uh, workers, workers who follow directions, who can sit still for a long period of time and do what they're told. Correct. And don't yeah. question authority, right? That oh. is, that's a huge piece of that is not to question authority. Don't question the the person in charge, whoever that is, whoever claims to be the authority. Question him or her. You are correct. 
I was just talking to my grandpa, Sean's dad, and he was telling me yesterday about your the uh, the teacher asking you when you're in like fourth grade how many islands there were. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So so I mean, just like anybody, we've all had great teachers and then teachers who weren't yeah, so great. Yeah. And and I had the ones that you remember. You remember the ones that you don't were not the great ones, right? And some what, some of them I had that would just sit at the front of the class, read the notes. We would write down the notes and that was class. Like she would just read to us. And so this one teacher was reading and it was about geography in the U S or something like that. And she says, okay, class, there are two, there are 50 States. We would write down there are 50 States because there are two of those States that are islands, Hawaii and Rhode Island. And so everybody wrote that down and, and I raised my hand and I said, I, I don't think Rhode Island's an island. And she said, she said, Sean, they wouldn't call it an island if it weren't an island. I said, I, I don't think so. So I, I went up to the map that's in the class and pointed to her. I said, see, I don't, I don't think that's an island. And that, that bit of correction was not appreciated in by, by her. And this was not a 23 year old teacher right out of college. This was a older teacher had been teaching that for 35 years like good lord yeah my dad got me out of it like he he's like and pulled the, you out of the class oh, he pulled me out the, i was out of that class the next day yeah oh that's awesome i love that there's so many um i'm now i'm like going through every single state and trying to get a ridiculous reason that it's named that too so that's awesome and <laughs> i'm like well of course that's the main state why and there's where's old york it's got to be there somewhere too right so it's the main state. like this is so, <laughs> so, that's, that's, so good. that's so important and look here's the reality there's amazing there are amazing humans who are teaching there are still amazing humans who are teaching in the system i we need good people there because we've got uh, some families that are completely broken and they're not going to see better humans than the ones they see in the school. So look, I'm all, I'm all for good human beings who are working even in a system that I don't agree with. But, um, you know, again, I, I don't hold back around my feelings for the system itself. So you saw these meta skills and you, you started an alternative school option for, for kids, right? So how, how does the ACT and Academy work and functionally be create different outcomes for kids yeah and i'm going to be very clear i'm not associated with acton at all anymore right zero percent associated with them i did open a few um we are opening we've got now 106 i believe apogee uh locations that are underneath what tim and i have created to focus on yeah out of skills too but there are some there are some similarities um well let me maybe ask it different not so much about acton but about that first step that you took to say hey i'm going to do something different outside of public schools for sure so um the the biggest things like you said the, the meta skill side and what's what's hard is okay i i think i'm probably in the middle uh, age wise of the two of you even though i look older than the both of you but here's what we all think of when we hear alternative school you're like oh those are the kids that are about to go to juvenile hall sure right <laughs> that, that that's what we think of that's when i grew up that's what it was all we mean is the alternative to this conveyor belt industrial model. And there's a million ways to have a better alternative to that. So we focus on a few key things. One, we want Socratic conversations. We want students to learn how to think and how to communicate. It's not what to think and when they have to think it by. It is how to think. All schools use the buzzwords of we're developing critical thinkers. Are you? I don't even think you started with thinking. Never mind critical thinking. Critical thinking means you're thinking about your thinking. It means you're actually willing to question what it is you believe. Look for the evidence. Listen to somebody else. So Sean or Sanger goes, okay, well, this is my uh, interpretation of that. And here's the data that I have. You can listen to that. You cannot feel emotionally attacked because somebody else has a different opinion than you. And you can go, hmm, all right, let me weigh the evidence. Let me ask. Let me be curious. Let me dive into that a little more. Right? All of these things are encompassed in thinking and then having the ability to communicate in what we call civil discourse. This country theoretically used to be able to do that. It's not bloods versus crips on every freaking situation. Yeah. Hey, like, let's have some conversation. This is what I believe is why I believe it. And I tell you what, we're going to find a whole lot of things, all three of us, that we agree on. That's awesome. We will find, if we dig long enough, things that none of us agree on. 
so what we just now we can't talk to each other right and so it's it's that whole concept so the communication piece is huge the socratic conversations piece is huge uh, the individualized academia academia is fine there's room there's time and place for it but let's take a look at it from a human development standpoint versus this concept of a grade level standpoint that's not real human development is real there's these different brain jumps and these stages that we go through eight is your huge brain jump 12 ish there's a huge brain jump another one at 16 yes another one at 25 but so why don't we go okay well what are people capable of right around there when they don't start really thinking in an abstract fashion until they're about 12 so why are we trying to jam word problems in earlier than that when they don't so it's just taking that development into play and understanding that some students are going to fly through some of the academia. So let's give them an ability to do that. I had 11 year olds doing trigonometry and calculus. I had other 11 year olds where it was like, man, addition and subtraction is still a hard thing. Okay, cool. You need to be better than you yesterday. Yeah. All right. So having the ability to personalize the, the academia mattered, having collaboration around solving problems that matter, creating something in a real world environment. How do you personalize the experience at scale? It's it's easier than ever at this point. So again, remember academia on a scale of importance, I'd say four or five other things are far more important than academia. Far more. I've seen plenty of students that have gone through the entire K through 12 academic standards in three years once they were ready for it. When, when you say the academic standards, are, are you talking about just the functional at the foundational level? Uh, knowledge math, base, knowledge, uh, historical knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, those types of things. Bingo. The limited knowledge at the low bar that is set for our standards, right? When people think school, they think life, life doesn't work in subjects, but they think, oh, but school works in subjects. And so you've got to regurgitate the information yeah. from each subject, right? I've seen <laughs> you've got to know when the Civil War was uh, and generally what it was about. There you go. You've done. Now keep going. Yeah. What is, yeah. Maybe like, who was the president? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and let's be honest. Can you Google that too? Like what is the, what is the functionality of that moving forward? That's such a, a very good point because I, when I train advisors, you know, I take someone who is college educated, but they've never been in a position to advise someone on their money. Like what I almost don't really care if they've had any college education on financial planning, uh, it, I don't think that really makes any difference on whether someone's going to be successful. I had a lot of that education, actual academic in college financial planning education, but I everything I needed to learn, I learned from working in the industry before that point. So I got, I was oh, bingo. So you're hitting. So listen, this is where we start getting to the crux of the difference between schooling and education. Yeah. Schooling says, here's the religion that everybody must go through the exact same time. You get good grades and that all the doors are going to open for you. Yeah. Education. GK Chesterton said it best. He said, education has nothing to do with subjects. He said, it's a transfer of a way of life. Yeah. Right. So when that's the case, what you just talked about was the apprenticeship model. It's working in a field with somebody who is ahead of you in that field and allowing that transfer of a way of life. My kids are 13, 11, and 8 right now. They can tell you that there are there's a 1040 tax system. There's a 1041 tax system. We operate in the 1041 tax system. Why? Because daddy owns businesses and the businesses have a cash flow and we can look at the PL and we can see how that flows into a business trust, which flows into a family trust, which flows into a private foundation. And we use our private foundation money to get, they don't have to fully understand that, but that's normal for them right now. Yeah. It's not a foreign language. So when they go need to implement it, they have all of these tools. Correct. But they can talk about that, but they haven't gotten their A in trigonometry yet. Right. So this is what we're talking about. So on our campuses, doing real work, launching real businesses where they're taking a product or service to the market and working with mentors who are actually in fields. So they're taking on these apprenticeship opportunities. They can do what they like and what they don't like. That's real education. Oh, and then they have responsibilities on campus. They have jobs on campus and internal economy. So the maturity level stays high. They're experiencing real world problems and real world things to solve 
that's a person that comes out and takes a whole lot more responsibility than somebody's like, no, I just, I sit and obey and get my grades. You you mentioned GK Chesterton. I, I don't know how familiar you are with the series of Chesterton Academies in the United States. There's one that just opened um, in Fort Worth a couple of years ago, and they're associated with the parish that I go to. What they do that's so cool is they, one of the ways that they are able to provide a private education for their students who otherwise would not be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. um, what other schools do is they just charge a lot of money to the capable families and so that they don't have to charge money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you're just subsidizing somebody else's child. What they do is they go, okay, for four days a week, you're coming to school. And on Fridays, you're going to go work at this company in town that has paid us effectively a very reduced rate to get access to the labor of six students every Friday or whatever. Uh, and I thought, I was like, whoa, that's such a great model to get someone, you know, capable of just even understanding the, those basic meta skills of, you know, how do you talk to your boss? <laughs> you know, how do you talk to a customer? Forget even the technical components of whatever industry they're working in. Oh, we, we, we would bring on interns. And one of the early questions that I would ask these interns when we would bring them into our business is I said, are you here to earn or learn? Because there, there were two paths we could take somebody down. And we, I said, we can just pay you this rate and we're going to work you. And we're not really interested in teaching you. We just want to get work product out of it for the dollar we're going to pay you. Or are you here to learn? And that's a lower, we're going to pay you less because you're going to be a drain on our productivity for a while because we're going to have to spend time showing you how we did this, why we did this, what comes next and, and teaching this. And it's interesting. Most of the people that we would bring in said, I, I want to do the learn track. Like I'll forego the money. Yeah. I want to, I want to learn. And, uh, I even had one, uh, one father, this was guy I knew, uh, he said, I want to, I want my son to be on the learn track and I want him, I want you to teach him. I'm going to pay you. Like he paid me, wow. or paid the guy's salary. He basically didn't pay me, but he paid the kid's salary for him to work in our office so he could learn from our. From yeah. Our that's a great opportunity for kids that, you know, have those resources, but for people that don't, the, that model was is interesting. Were you concerned when you look at, so I, I know you're trying to solve the issue of metacognition around how students are thinking about what they think about and how to think for themselves and using the Socratic method as a, as a way to get them to think about that. So that's, that's a very interactive teaching, a lot of, a lot of questioning, a lot of dialogue. Yes, sir. Were, were you concerned that there might be, that that might be a bigger pitfall if you get the wrong teacher in there who's basically uh, indoctrinating or teaching them the wrong types of things uh, in terms of their point of view, for example? Great question. Concerned? No. Intentional? Yes. That's a great question. It's a very astute question. That is paramount to this being effective. Are you know, what we call guides that act and what we call coaches on the Apogee side that is a huge piece of that. So we do continuous training for the coaches throughout the entire network. Again, we got 106 locations right now. We've got, I think we'll probably add 100 a year. I'm talking physical K through 12 campuses over the next few years. Uh, and I will continuously work with, and I've got a team that continuously works with all of the locations as well as our coaches on things like that. How do you do this well without tipping your hat? It is not up to the coach, the guy to give away what he or she believes in anything. That's the point, right? Is not to have any kind of nod to any sort of thing that can look like, here's my opinion, here's an indoctrination of any sort. It is, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? How do I poke back? Doesn't matter if I agree with you and I don't agree with you or vice versa. How do I poke back and go, okay, but what about this? To each one of you and then get you to learn to engage in that civil dialogue with each other. You're exactly right. It's such a hard thing to do, but that is such an important piece of that. Very much so. How does a teacher demonstrate that ability to you before they're put in a position where they're 
doing it with students? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great question too. We want to see evidence of I want to see some evidence of curiosity. But here's here's one of the things, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this too. Um, I always say hiring somebody it's like dating. You're you, you want to go through a process. You want to get to know each other. You want to try to get to the root of who that person really is as quickly as possible. And then you're making the best guest. Yeah, I'm going to go into a relationship with this person and we're going to see where this goes. Hiring. Yeah, you might be wrong sometimes. You might be wrong sometimes. Hiring is the same thing. Um, so for people like this, it's best to be very clear and upfront and very intentional. Right. I always tell people the best date I ever had in college was uh, this girl savvy. I'd been waiting to go out with her forever. And we sit down on that very first date and she's like, okay. She's like, I want to just be very clear up front. She's like, I, I absolutely love country music. She's like, that's a non-negotiable. She's like, that's you. I need you to like country music. She's like, I, I love uh, pageants, like the Miss America pageants. I want you to watch every single one of those pageants with me. And when the Oscars comes on, it's an Oscar party. <laughs> and you're gonna get, she's like, you're going to get dressed up and we're going to you know, have an Oscars party. And I'm like, that's so awesome that you are so like up front with this. I'm like, here's $20. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> I'm done. I'm gone. But thank you. Right. Because that clarity up front. Cool, man. You just saved me months of heart. You're beautiful and done. Right. So like there's, you saved me so much heartache. So I want to do this. I do the same thing. I encourage our affiliate owners to do the same thing. Look, this is how we need you to show up. I don't care what your political views are, your ideological views. Your, I, I don't care, but I need you to know they better never know. We got to be upfront about that. And so then the training is always around how to do that better. It's hard, man. It's hard. We all tend to want our opinions to come out and be, it's very hard. And I'm not going to pretend anybody's perfect at it, but it's upfront and then we continue to work on it. Yeah, the you best know, I, teacher I, I ever had who, who, who did that, you know, it was at a private school and I uh, went to public school up until the last two years of high school. I went to private school and he I think it was coach chapel every student thought that he was the like opposite ideology that they had that so that was seemingly the takeaway is they all thought no oh, he's just so dang liberal he's so he's too conservative or whatever and it was like it seems to me that you think that he's the opposite I didn't think that I was like I think he's just like he's game of the soul it's like a, I think he's like a like a Romney Republican or something. You know, I thought he was like kind of just like a boring middle somewhere. Um, the guy's like super hardcore lefty. Like now that he's not working there, he's like radical left wing, always posting on Facebook. I was like, that's amazing that no one would have, no one would have thought he was, you know, this like socialist because he did a really good job. He did a really good job and good on him, man. I mean, one of the best compliments I ever got is we had one of my campuses when I still lived in California, we had, um, it was 2020 when uh, Joe Jorgensen was running as the libertarian candidate right, for president. And so she did her Northern California tour at one of my campuses. And so I had the, the honor of introducing her as this presidential candidate. And, um, and as she's speaking, we had, we had so many people there on campus. I had three different occasions of people coming up to me during that event one, it was like, man, I see how you're running these campuses. I see how you're running the school. The students get to, you know, have voices. And you're clearly liberal. So why are like <laughs> Joe Jorgensen here, right? Like what? That's interesting to me, right? Same event, man. I had somebody who was just like, oh my gosh, I I didn't, I kind of knew, I kind of knew just the way you operate. I knew you were a libertarian, but like this confirms it. That's great. I love this, right? And then I had somebody else come up to me too. And they're like, hey man, like this is interesting to me because you're clear, like, wearing a suit you guys have are starting so many businesses with the students you're pro business are you carrying right now i'm like yeah i got a 38 right here and he's like okay so you're republican right <laughs> like, and it's like man i love that i love that yeah that's that's really good yeah they sh shouldn't shouldn't know but if people can understand more of what they believe through being guided by these types of questions that's amazing, yeah. it's amazing. That's the point. You know, that's what education, you know, that's what education should be for. We I I hear a lot of particularly this comes out of people who I who are more conservative and they'll complain about the public school system. They're like, well, that that has no place in the public school system. You ever heard people say that, yeah. you know, whatever they're saying. And I'll always say, no, it absolutely does have a place that I said, you don't understand the point of the government school system is to actually 
tell your kids yeah. those things. Like it's that is the point that's, of the school that's system the goal. is to tell them that. Let me ask you a question. When you when you look at and I guess this is particularly for men, because I, I think the the way the school structure is set up is probably a mismatch more for men than than women on how young men sort of think and grow. Correct. What do I have to fight against after I get out of school that the school has taught me? What do I have to, what do you think I ought to unlearn yeah, to, that's to move forward? A great question right there because unlearning is just, especially now, you can make an argument that it's just as relevant as learning, being able to learn. How, how quickly do things change right now? Five years ago, we, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, we wouldn't have had, we didn't have Riverside and be able to jump on this. This cell phone I've got right here is going to be a pager in the next five, six, seven years. I don't know. Things are going to continue to evolve. So you got to be able to learn what is needed. You got to be able to unlearn and not be stuck to certain things. So that's a really good question. I appreciate that question very much. Um, I, I get a lot of people who, will theoretically take my side on uh, the systemic issues of the government schools. But they want to focus on, look, it's the indoctrination, it's the early sexualization, it's the, you know, it's the DEI, it's the CRT, it's all, uh, cool, great. We can make arguments around some of that sometimes, some districts, cool, that's fine. The biggest, sneakiest issue are the habits of conformity take place. To me, that is the biggest, that is the biggest issue that we have to unlearn. It's the habit of somebody else is always going to tell you what to do and when to do it. You have to ask permission to everything, including I'm 18, may I go to the bathroom, please? And they may say no. Uh, it, don't talk when you're not you know, spoken to, go walk in your straight line, go like it's that. Those habits of I got to give the story of Matt I started out with a pen and now at five, I went, oh, you tell me what the story of Matt is and we're going to do that until you're 18. People don't pick the pen back up very quickly. They struggle with that. Um, and so there's this whole developmental game of you don't get to find out who you are, what you're excited about, what you're not excited about. You don't get a lot of responsibility. So now it seems like an issue. You've been force fed a bunch of things that maybe have not been made relevant to you. And so now you start to confuse learning with school. And that's not the case. We are learning machines. We are growing machines. The factory setting of a human is curiosity and wonder and asking questions. And we want to create and we want to do that gets sucked out because you start to equate that as learning and it's not. Um, so those are the biggest habits, man, that you end up having to unlearn and people don't unlearn it very fast. Almost every employee that's ever worked with me has told, has had to unlearn this like need to ask for permission. Yeah. And they, and they know it about, they're like, ah, I'm sorry, I have this habit. And it's worse if they've worked for, you know, a bad leader before. For sure. You know, so they went through school, they're experiencing this, you know, conformity training that you're talking about. And then they go see it put in practice and they're like, now it's not rewarding in the, in a, in a bad leader's domain. You know, they're not necessarily getting rewarded for this conformity, but they aren't getting harmed by it. And so I think like that's, um, you know, there were in uh, Jordan Peterson's, uh, one of his books, he talked about the zebra stripes, right? It, it, when the scientists tried to study zebras, they would like hit them with a paintball gun and that never worked they would because you can't tell which zebra is which zebra so okay we'll hit them with the paintball gun now we know the zebra with the orange dot that's the one we're looking at and then they'd always get mauled by lions because this zebra stands out right and the lions are using that to their advantage they go we're going to go for the zebra with the everybody to the orange yeah. dot guy yeah and so like there is some benefit in general to say okay where are your stripes like don't you don't need to stand out all the time in all ways, mm -hmm. but that's not the same as just totally sell your soul to conform, especially when the system is asking you to do things that are not in your interest. So I think a lot of people's experiences, they feel safe and comfortable conforming partly because they've been taught, but partly because they have stories in their life where conforming kept me 
off the chopping block. That's right. You know, I wasn't loud and asking that bad leader questions that were hard to answer. So I didn't get laid off because he didn't even know my name. For sure. <laughs> there's always, I always say it's more comfortable to be, uh, th- there's more comfort in a known slavery than an ambiguous freedom. Because. It, oh man. And that that's it, deep right there. And the reality is it feels fine and it feels safe until it's not. And then it feels like you are absolutely screwed and you might be 2020 was a great example of this if you weren't educated you know uh, let me back up my thought on education and, and i believe it or not was never asked this all through stanford through my being in public schools being like this was never a question that came up seth godin asked me what should education be for oh, gosh nobody's actually asked me that and i didn't know the chesterton quote at that point of you know this transfer of life and which I, I love that is one of my favorite definitions, maybe my favorite definition, but I thought about it and I said, well, I think education ultimately is supposed to be for sovereignty, it's supposed to be for sovereignty and freedom in whatever way I define that. But how I define that is that I don't have to do anything I don't want to do with anybody. I don't want to do if I'm not, you know, behoving to anybody that I don't want to be without harming somebody else too. So what happens if somebody can go, oh, okay, well, the stores are now closed and you can't get toilet paper. Okay, then what? Are you okay? Hey, you can't go get food anymore. Are you okay? Is your family okay? Hey, you don't have a job anymore. Job's all gone. Hey, the market crashed. Hey, the the things that you will never have control over, can they take away your livelihood in an instant? Because if they can, you are not safe. Yeah. Informing. How do you how do you help someone find what that nonconformity should be? In other words, that that draws them to that passion, draws them to that uh, sense of purpose where they can really shine when they are at that age. I mean, I, I think it's easier for a lot of people who are, uh, you know, in their forties or fifties to figure out here's my purpose, here's what I'm good at because I've had a life to live it. But when somebody is going through schooling, the the whole world's open to them, and they may not know what that is. How do you how do you help figure yeah, that out? It's a really good question, and and it's there is no fail safe. Um, that'd be ridiculously presumptuous and arrogant of anybody to say that. Like, well, here is the answer um, on that. That is a blanket statement for all of humanity. Um, again, that would sound more like school. School says, this is how you do it. Everybody does this. We, we say grade level. We say grades. We say that like, that's pretty arrogant in my experience. Um, so I think there's a few things though that we try to do that we've seen be successful. So I won't say it's a, everybody should. I'll say this is how we, and this is what we've seen be successful. Uh, there's three three main components for me. One, surrounding surrounding them with the right people who are doing this first. So what I mean is, if, uh, if we go back to Chesterton's idea of a transfer of way of life. So I've got three children upstairs, 13, 11, and eight. My wife and I are transferring our way of life to them. Likewise, anybody else that I'm willing to put in front of them or put them in front of, I'm giving a nod to you now are, are able to transfer a bit of your way of life to my children, right? My son goes to American top team out here for, for wrestling and kickboxing and I love the coaches. I love their mentality. I love the way they approach things. I love the honor and the respect and the integrity that is shown there. I'm giving that a nod to go, yes, I want you to influence my son. There's education taking place there in those experiences. And so it's being intentional on who gets to impact. So when we're talking about on our campuses, who are the mentors? Who are the people that are there? Who are the parents? The parents are always and forever the primary educators. One thing we are doing with our Apogee campuses that nobody else is doing is you send your children to an Apogee campus, you go through Apogee man and Apogee woman as mom and dad. You go through a very intensive 12 month educational experience. Why? You need to get better as a human. The best way to educate a young person is for the parents to get educated, continue their own education and bring those kids along. Make that normal in the house. Make those conversations around the 1040 and the 1041 system normal yeah what a cool concept because people talk about this all the time you know oh the problem with our schools is the parents you know but i i haven't heard of many i lots of private schools claim to 
uh, screen, you know. Right. But it, like, I mean, I went to a, a, a great Christian school. I loved it. I thought it was an amazing experience, especially juxtaposed to the terrible public school experience I had. And I was surprised to learn pretty quickly that their claim of filter and all we look, it's Christian families only, like we have a standard, da, 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 da. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> I just love, I'm just looking at the bumper stickers in the pickup line. No, you don't. <laughs> yes, sir. You know? Agreed. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely honest. I remember, to, you know, I'm not drawing this analogy too tightly, but, um, you know, we send all our dogs to training when we get a new dog. And the last trainer that we went to, uh, he, he was like, all right, so there will be, here's what I need you to come. And there was as, almost as much training for the dog owners as there was for the dog. You know, which is super important. Yes, I mean, sir. exactly what you're saying. Yeah, it's so interesting. And this is, I know, and I, I don't want to go. I won't go too far on a, on the side tangent. But uh, we had Dr. Camilo Ortiz come on um, with our young men that we mentor not too long ago, and um, he's a behavioral psychologist. And he says, "Look, my business model is atrocious as far as like as far as business, but as far as efficacy, um, as far as as far as ethically, as far as." I think I don't know of anybody doing this better. Um, he works with a lot of young people who are coming in with the anxiety issues and, and things like that that we're seeing with a lot of our young people. And he does what they call responsibility therapy. And their answer is, and this leads into one of the next kind of pillars for us, is he goes, okay, first I start with the parents. If we got the young people that are having these issues, he goes, my first session's with the parents. And I go, hey, what are you doing? Are you leading by example? Are you being, because they're going to be who you are before they do what you say. So are you doing the right things and moving yourself forward and leading by example? So are you doing that? And then two, are you getting the frick out of the way? Because a lot of it, there's some over parenting too. So we're not giving kids responsibility early enough too. And so he's given, you know, he's getting parents on board first and then making sure they're able to hand over responsibility. So that's kind of that next, you know, as to surround them with, with the right, with the right people. And that includes the right, you know, all the right inputs, the books matter, TV matter, all those things matter. The music mat, those do matter to the extent the people matter more. Covey, right? You're the five, you're the product of the five people you spend the most time with. Why is that different for our children? They're still people. It matters. So who, who do they, you know, get all those influences from? But that second part is responsibility. So giving them a massive dose of responsibility early, they actually crave that. They they respond very well to that. Give them responsibility. And in those responsibilities, um, give them a number of experiences too. I kind of put those two together, responsibilities and experiences. So we live on a farm now. We moved out of California a couple of years ago. We're in farm in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, there's a lot of work on a farm. Don't know if you've heard about that, uh, but, but there's a lot, especially when you, you know, we provide um, food to local restaurants as, as well. And I mean, there's a lot of things to do here on the farm. All of my kids have a massive amount of responsibility on this farm every morning, every night, period. It looks different every season. It doesn't matter if somebody's sick, it doesn't feel good. The animals tend to die if you don't feed them. So we're going to go ahead and feed them even if we don't feel like it. Um, but they have a massive amount of responsibility and that's been a really, really good thing. We'll do the same thing on campuses, the cleaning, the cleaning of the bathrooms, the take care. The kids are doing those things. They all have jobs. So they get that responsibility and then tied into that is experience exposure. So it's like, how do you find the, your favorite food? Try a bunch of food. If you've only ever had five foods, yeah. And I'm like, all right, Sean, what's your favorite food? Is it English, math? Is it science? Is it right? And it's like, oh, this is how I'm defining it. It's like, oh, I guess it's this one, right? Because you got to pick one. But if we actually go, okay, what are your favorite foods? Here's this buffet. And you've had a chance over the course of 10, 12, 15 years to try this food and to try this one and this one and this one. One, you're going to make a more educated, uh, declaration of what your favorite one is. But what gets cool is you start to go, ah, man, I don't know. I, I really liked, you know, the tacos and I, but I also really like Korean barbecue and shit. What would happen if I put them together? What if I create it? Right. You start to get more creative because you have more experience. So those experiences of them starting multiple businesses, working multiple apprenticeships, taking on multiple roles on campus, solving problems, that have to do with, you know, uh, 
the cleaning, cleaning up the ocean, you know, one session for six weeks and then going into how do I compete against my classmates to build the best rocket that's going to go the highest to, uh, you know, creating uh, a business around physiology and kinesiology, like give them a number of experiences. So that's that second part. And then the last part I'll say to answer this to, to again, give them the best possible chance as far as what we've seen. This is the sneaky part and this is where we need parents to help. It's eliminating the distractions. It's addition by subtraction too. Video games, um, you know, the, that I don't vilify video games, but the reality is if you have a young man and he's spending five, six, seven hours a day checking off that DNA box that all young men have of wanting to slay the dragon and, and rescue the princess and go create something and go, he might be checking that off artificially and he's draining himself, draining his dopamine, doesn't want to go out into the real world afterwards to actually accomplish anything. That's a problem, right? So eliminating those distractions matters too. And so that's, again, where we need the family's help. Um, but I'll tell you what, you get a recipe of all those things put together, you tend to have uh, a young person that that maintains those factory settings of curiosity and wonder and, and hard work. And, and you see the maturity come out a whole lot earlier. I got really lucky with video games growing up in the video beginning of the video game age. I don't know if my parents did this intentionally, but I just never had the console that all my friends had. So I had the other one, <laughs> like, you know, it was like everybody's PlayStation. I got an Xbox. Uh, and so it made it hard for me to like get consumed by it. Um, and I didn't really, other than maybe some brief periods. Uh, but I love your analogy of the foods, right? If you if you've categorized life and school and education into these buckets, it's it's hard to make the connection of well, what's your favorite subject? Oh, you should go be an airline pilot. That's you know, there's no subject that's going to tell me that. Um, and the reality is, even within something so specific as a career, there's a million different ways to do that. You know, you can be a financial advisor who's really interested and you also love reading or you also love writing. Okay, well, you can be a content creator in that industry. You don't have to just be this cog in a wheel somewhere. So that what an amazing impact that I'm sure that's having. Is there a, I, I know you focus on creating challenges for kids to overcome because it's a part of ma the maturity process. Is there a specific challenge that you've created for students that you've seen have a really extraordinary impact? It's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, there's, there's a couple that I, that I would say are, um, my, my favorites for who they have to be to, to get through and come out the other side. Um, our, our CEO interview process, um, is, one of my favorite things so the students whether they're the mentored students in our mentorship programs or whether it's on uh, on a campus uh, our home education families one of the things that we're having our students create is a digital portfolio so it's a like a report card is is great you play the game well you obey well and the teacher that was your english teacher goes yeah you obeyed great here's an a your math teacher goes yeah you obeyed and played the game that we designed and you did well so here's your a it's, it's a silly, it doesn't represent anything of value. You can't see anything about that young person from that. We have them create digital portfolios. It's essentially branding 101. It is, here's who I am and here's the proof that I am who I say I am. Here are all the things that I am doing. Here's what I'm creating. And so in the process of that, they're taking on these various challenges. The CEO interviews are great. They're being forced to sit down and by what I forced, I mean, challenged and invited to, but as the, the more they do it, the better they get and the more, you know, they're having these positive outcomes. They're sitting down and they're interviewing CEOs, law enforcement officers, um, first responders. They, they get used to having high level conversations with high level humans. That does multiple things. You start to get, again, comfortable with that communication piece. You start to develop a network of people around you that it leads sometimes to apprenticeship opportunities or job opportunities. But you start to also notice patterns. We talked about patterns at the very beginning. 
you sit down and with 20, 30, 40 different CEOs over the course of a year, and you start to hear some of the same sort of responses, you start to see the patterns of success. You start to go, okay, well, this guy was successful here. This guy was successful here. And this guy's successful here. Wildly different paths and upbringings, but they all said this, right? And so being able to pull out those patterns and reflect. So that that's one of my favorites. Um, one of the more obscure uh, challenges that I absolutely love is we do a paperclip challenge uh, with our mentees. And the paperclip challenge is what it sounds like. You start out with a paperclip and and you guys may have seen the uh there was a ted oh uh, the the barter barter your way from a paperclip to a yacht or whatever it was i did it the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the yeah. ted the ted talk was to a house yeah 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 yeah, right? yeah so we have them go through the same thing and and who they have to become to get comfortable going okay i want to figure out how to trade this now i traded you know i traded from a, a paperclip and i'm up to some uh, remote control and and nobody wants a remote control except this guy is a remote control connoisseur and collects them. All right, maybe I can trade with him. So the intentionality there and the communi- you know, the communicative skills and um, yeah, man, it's so, so much fun. We had a young man recently got his very first truck, 16, you know, 16 years old, got his very first truck, $0 spent. From the paperclip. Yes, sir. Started with- Wow. Like, oh, I, that's that answers, great. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask how how far have you seen somebody go? That's, that's so uh, incredible. That's, that's past what I thought it would be. That's the best example we have. But I'll tell you, I've done even short term, even like on campus. I'll grab a group of high schoolers and I took them out to a mall. We were at a mall for two hours, just in a the local mall on like a Wednesday morning. So it's not like it's jam packed. We're at a local mall, and I'm like, all right, man, you guys got two hours. Let's see what you can come back with. You can't leave the mall. So it's just strangers in the mall. You can go into the stores if you want, or like, here you go. I had five or six, you know, young people with us. They came back. Uh, somebody came back with some clothing. Um, somebody came back with a big giant neon sign. I don't remember exactly what it was, uh, what the sign said, but it was like something you'd hang up in a man cave, you know, in a garage kind of thing. Yeah. We had yeah. somebody come back with a functional operating cell phone. Wow. Within two hours. And it's not about what you get. <laughs> like, that's not the thing, right? It's about what you what you learned in that process, who you became in that process, and how you transfer that to another endeavor. And embedded in both of those challenges is uh, rejection exposure. And a lot mm-hmm. of kids don't have an opportunity, especially when we, we digitize communication. You know, you're not even getting like the soft rejection of, having to go sit down next to someone at the lunch table or whatever, you know, um, I was talking to a client of mine who was dealing with some of his employees They're like, man, I got this sales guy. He knows the script. He knows what he's supposed to say and he won't make the sale and he keeps passing it up. And he tells me it's cause he was scared. And I'm like, you got to take this guy out and basically have him do these challenges. Like go have, take him to Starbucks, and you're going to do a Starbucks tour and he's going to ask for a free cup of coffee at every Starbucks in town until he gets totally comfortable asking and getting told no. And he enjoys getting told no. And until then, he's never going to. Yeah. Like, you you, can't you remember we had it. We had a hiring campaign at our office uh, several years ago. And it, Sanger remembers this. So we we had I, I think it was like eight uh, college grads come come up to the office. and We gave them that challenge just like what you described. I, I said, I want you to just go into this, the shopping area, meet some people, come back, tell me what you learned. Tell, tell me, me what, yeah. You know, tell me about them. Tell me about them. What did you learn? What was the experience? And one of them, you remember one of them <laughs> came <laughs> back and he said, well, um, yeah, I didn't do it. You know, I went to lunch with my mom. I got my mom came over and uh, we went to you know, chicken, chicken express. express. <laughs> and I said, Oh, and I'm trying to save the guy. You know, I said, okay, well, what did you learn it there? Like, what? Yeah. How, did, how was that? And he's like, oh, you know, nothing really. I was like, hey, listen, no, uh, you, I'm going to say. Did you, talk to, did you talk to the drive-thru lady? Right. He goes, no, my mom ordered. My mom ordered. <laughs> and then, so I said, listen, I'm going to save you some time today. And I, I wish you the best in life. I yeah. wish, you know, all the best. I don't think this is a good match for uh, your skills. <laughs> but but you've got to figure that out. You do. Yeah. And look, and I, and uh, you, man, and, and I wish I could say, oh, that's surprising. It's not. I see it over and over. I hear it 
from employers over and over and over again, all over the world. Um, and some of the pushback we'll get, you know, from parents of, okay, well, my child's very introverted, you know, and so this, okay, but you can still order food at a restaurant. Right. Introverted yes. doesn't explain why I had a lady call me and go, hey, I, I'm, I'm interested in job openings at one of your campuses. Okay, great. And I could hear it in her voice. I'm like, Okay, well, you something maybe are you a retired teacher? Or what's going? She's a little older. I, so what's? Well, no, no, it's not actually for me. Okay, oh, no. Who are you calling? Who are you calling on behalf of? My son. How old's your son? Thirty-two. What the? What the what? You know, like what? Why? And this is not something that I can tell you. I only experienced once. I mean, twenty-seven-year-olds with parents coming to interviews. Look, you're and, kidding. No, sir. And I wish <laughs> I was the only person that had this. I've, I, and look, I'm not making a blanket statement. This is not all young 20 somethings. Sure. I, I, like, right. that's, I understand that's not the case, but I also understand I've seen it more than once and I know others that have as well. So my, my point is like introversion is one thing. I understand that, but still being able to communicate, ordering your own food, like that's, that's a different level. Um, you know that again communication skills matter it doesn't mean you're going to be a salesman doesn't mean you're going to be that's fine maybe i'm, I'm there's just going to be an engineer cool you're still gonna to have to talk to other people and collaborate with other people at some point that's a that's a skill self-discipline is a skill even if you're introverted self-discipline is a skill to be able to do things you don't necessarily want to do but these are the things that need to be done right now cool let's still give you experience of developing those and maybe that comes with communicating when it's uncomfortable i don't care right yeah i mean ha having the confidence to communicate it gives you the ability to persuade others which is the number one success talent yeah. if somebody's going to be a business leader before um, we wrap up what's your top decision making tip for business owners it's a good, it, that's a good question um, because business owners uh, in various stages that, that this could be taken and, uh, you know, obviously a number of ways. Um, and a lot of the men and women that we have in our mentorship programs are business owners too. So we talk about these, these kind of things a lot. Um, Mike Glover said to me a couple of years ago, and I've loved this and I've, I've hung on to this. He says, look, per perfection isn't possible, but it remains the standard. And he was talking about specifically the mantra of of the soldiers working at the uh the the tomb of the unknown soldier right he's talking about those guys but it transfers to really everything so perfection not possible but it remains the standard for business owners your business will never be perfect you'll never be the perfect boss you'll never you know it's not going to be perfect but i think making decisions from the perspective of i want to create the ideal version of this business and whatever it is I'm deciding, what is the ideal, is a better posture to take than most people's posture, which is how do I avoid problems? How do I fix a problem? How do I navigate a problem? They're just surrounding themselves with the mindset of like, what the, there, there's a problem versus the mindset of what is the ideal and how do I get one step closer? So that's what we've been leading into lately with our business owner clients is, is let's make a decision based on the perspective of creating the ideal version. That's yeah, that's amazing. Um, I was so glad that you came, Matt. Uh, I remember hearing on, I think it was Tim Kennedy's Instagram page like years ago. Hey, I'm, I'm working on these schools. I'm going to get this thing started. I was like, man, I'm ex so excited to see what, what's going to come out of that and to, to know that it's going full force and to, hear about what y'all are doing is really, really exciting and motivating for change in this country. Thank you for that. Where can people connect with you and the the work that you're doing? Yeah. Uh, best place for people to go is apogeestrong.com. Uh, we've got a little documentary that's there. You can find where our physical education centers are. You can find all the different verticals, men, women, young men, young ladies on the way, um, home education tribe. So everything's there on the website. We're probably most active on Instagram at Apogee Program as well. Great. Yeah, we'll put we'll put links Thanks, on that on the uh, on the show notes. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks for talking to us. Honor is absolutely mine. Appreciate you guys. My takeaway from talking with Matt is looking at some some things that we've talked about before. Is that when you recognize an issue, whether it's in your business or uh, philanthropy you're trying to start or something like that is is what is the main issue that you're attacking and then 
having the open-mindedness to seek sort of non-standard solutions for that, you know, and he could have he could have solved that issue a lot of different ways, but he he picked a really unique solution looking at that Socratic method and then encouraging sort of those relationships and that curiosity in people and allowing that customization. And so I, th I think in a lot of business solutions and a lot of decision making, looking for that opposite solution and then looking for those creative customized solutions. My biggest takeaway is the last quote at the end, perfection's not the standard or perfection's not possible, but it remains the standard. And that's true in business. Like that's true in life too. The, perf the perfect standard of Jesus Christ is unattainable, but we will continue to aim at it. And, um, giving herself the grace to know that hey, I'm not going to meet this perfection all the time, but that doesn't accepting the fact that I can't be perfect does not change the standard. You just made a great decision to listen to this episode of decidedly make another great decision by subscribing to the show and leaving us a review wherever you're listening. We appreciate the support. It helps business owners like you find our community and defeat bad decision-making in their own lives. For more decision-making insights, check us out at decidedlypodcast.com on Instagram at decidedly podcast or grab a copy of Sanger and Sean's books from the links in the show notes. Finally, we'd like to thank Shelby Peterson of Transcend Media for editing and post-production of the show. Thanks for listening. I'm Morgan, your producer, and this is Decidedly.